on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. Joining me once again is Professor Richard Wolf. Uh, you know him well from this program, from Economic Update on Free Speech TV, and from his books, including The Sickness is the System, as well as Democracy at Work, which can be found at democracyatwork.info. He, he's also a professor and a, uh, emeritus and a pro visiting professor, but... Um, Enough about that. We have uh, we have big issues to discuss. So first of all, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, RJ. I'm looking forward to it. As am I, as always. Uh, look, we just interviewed uh, someone who's covering the massive protests and strikes underway in France. There's an enormous uh, reaction to a uh, uh, government action to cut pensions there, as you well know. Uh, there is also, even though that appears to have uh, made it past virtually uh, all but the final process toward becoming law, those protests as, of the, as we speak show no signs of diminishing. We've also had uh, violence and uh, unrest and protests in Greece. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, intermittent protests here in the United States, uh, the most uh, dramatic of which, of course, were uh, during the uh, height of the COVID pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement we've had, but uh, although it's relatively quiescent now, um, we have signs that it could reappear in the U.S. as well. Uh, there is discontent elsewhere in the world, and I'm wondering whether all of this portends something significant it's always hard to know in the heat of the moment uh whether whether a major shift is coming or whether it's a ripple on the surface but i'm wondering what we can make of what's going on let's say in greece or in france uh and what this might tell us about the present moment and the future well i think um it's very appropriate to talk about this. It's very much lurking all around the headlines. Uh, if you dare to read them and if you dare to face them, I think the coverage uh, here in the United States of both the events in France and Greece are outrageously underdeveloped and undone given the importance of the events. So let me pick up the following and put it in this way way i can't tell the future any better than anybody else can i can't tell you if a revolution is coming or when it's coming or how it'll hit or even the forms it'll take revolutions like other important events in human history are always in many ways unique are always in many ways shocking and even the people who did predict them couldn't predict the, the exact timing the exact form form and i can't either having said that here's one thing that revolutions usually reflect that the contradictions uh, of the society the problems of the society are simply not getting solved they're taking too long they are hurting too many people and the hurt is too serious mm -hmm. That's one part of it. And the other part is that the people in charge of the society have lost the confidence of the mass of the people. In other words, they don't seem to be able to understand what's going on, to manage what's going on. And that combination of problems that are getting more and more serious and the leadership that is appearing to be more and more incompetent, that means you're giving two reasons for the mass of people finally to stand up and become part of the history rather than spectators and victims of the history. And that's what you're seeing in France. I mean, the polls consistently show in France something on the order of two-thirds of the people, roughly 65%, support the opposition to the government, support the strikes, support the street demonstrations, support all of that activity. That in itself 
is an astonishing reality. And even now, after two weeks or more of the strikes, there have been, I think, nine official days of, of mass action, even today, um, that number hasn't changed. In other words, the efforts of the government, starting with President Macron, using all the standard tactics of governments, uh, we won't listen to the to the people in the street when they're obviously doing it. We will make reforms to make this okay when they're obviously either incapable or uninterested in doing so, or when it gets difficult for them, focusing on random acts of burning a car or overturning a car, trying to portray the demonstration as violent or scary or threatening to the general welfare and the, the you know, basically smearing the demonstrators. They did that in France. They always do it in France. It doesn't usually work. It hasn't worked this time. So the, the demonstrations go on. This morning, as we're as I'm speaking to you, uh, they closed down Charles de Gaulle Airport, the major airport in the country, uh, and they've closed down the rail system and, and everything else. You have to remember, unions are very powerful in France, and they are quite powerful in Greece as well. The unions are in the forefront of all of this action. And they're supported by half a dozen political parties and countless social movements, national, regional, and local. It's a combination that shuts down whatever it wants to. In the face of all of this, we have a president who's so out of touch. By the way, he's always been a minority president. He's always been disliked by the majority of the people. He's starting in a bad place and has managed with true political genius to get into an even worse space than he began with. And he's now attached himself to this plan. And what is the plan? To deprive the French working class of two years of retirement pension coverage that they have contributed to that they have made all their decisions in their life, whether to buy a home, whether to live in this area, based on the assumption which the government guaranteed that they would have a pension at this point in their life of this amount of money. So you're betraying these people, you're hurting them, and why? Because you don't want to tax corporations and the rich, because that's the issue. The taxes on them are low. The French could raise the tax, solve the problem, end of story. And that's what this is about. A president revealing that he is the tool of the ruling class in the country. It's clear. It's naked. And because it's France, everybody says that. The newspapers say that. You don't have the taboo on saying honestly what's going on. But the way you still do in the United States. And in Greece, again, the same. The government privatized the railroads. They used to be run by the government, which made sure that they were safe. You to privatize, it means you're giving the railroads from being run by a government whose objective is to move the people and make it safe and reliable to a company whose first objective is to make a profit. The government doesn't have to make a profit. That variable isn't present if the government is there. So if a private company comes in and makes profit, it's number one objective, which the companies in question admit they do. So it's not me saying it. Well, then you're going to have shortcuts and you're going to take risks. And there are 60 people who died a few weeks ago in a French railway accident. A Greek, Greek rare. Uh, sure, I think, yes, yes, yeah. my mistake, a Greek. Uh, and unlike the United States, where a few politicians blame each other for such things and make statements about how interested they are in safety, and then it all disappears, that's not the way it works in countries that have had it up to here. The Greek working class denounced the privatization of railroads as contributing and needing to be changed in the wake 
of honoring the dead from this accident. And the government, the conservative government, wouldn't hear of it. Okay, then they went into the streets, and now the government is their target. Very much like in France. I don't know how this will work out. Maybe this isn't the moment when it becomes a revolution. But one thing I'm clear of, the intensity, the sharpness of the contradictions, the glaring injustice of all of this is making masses of people angry and bitter and clearly seeing what's going on. And that genie, once out of the bottle, is going to be very, very hard uh, to push back in to that bottle. Imagine with me what might happen if the American people began to understand that they're all threatened by unsafe railway systems that pass in your village or in your town or nearby and if they blew up the way it did there and you had to live with toxic clouds and the value of your home vanished etc etc what happens then when we get it what happens when people understand that an inflation is has been profitable over the last year for a large swath of american industry which is why it isn't going away. It hasn't been good for the mass of people. Their wages haven't kept up, but it has been profitable. And so we're going to have it a bit longer. The Federal Reserve didn't even raise interest rates the way it had said it would. Why? Because we're in such a mess that to raise the interest rate worsens the collapse of our banks. This is a system that doesn't work that is plunging people into greater and greater difficulty, suffering, risk, danger. Yeah, revolutions come when you have the combination we do. Growing problems, worsening conditions, and a government apparatus that is grotesquely and obviously uh, incapable of dealing with it. One of the reasons why I even posed the question to begin with and use a word as dramatic as revolution is because for much of my lifetime, it seemed as a, and the world into which I was born, the post-war world into which I was born, it seemed that, like it or not, that the forces of profit, of capitalism, of greed, what have you, and the, fo the forces of interest of the workers to a very different degrees in different countries, but in the Western world, so-called, were in a kind of stasis. There were, uh, there was a, a perhaps an uneasy truce, but there was a kind of a truce, a kind of a balance, and it seems to me that that's been lost and that uh whatever the consequences the forces of profit of greed of capitalism are nothing uh, less and less seems to be restraining them so you have uh the privatization of the railroads in greece leading to this horrific catastrophe and yet uh, you know the ruling government clicks you know offering no real solution you have a, a similar fortunately not at least not as immediately as lethal an accident but a very dangerous and unhealthy accident in east palestine ohio in the united states and uh after a loosening of regulations for railroads here no real plan for reform our secretary of transportation couldn't be bothered to stop posing for the cameras i guess long enough to show up there until he was shamed into it you have france where despite as you describe uh immense beatings to his personal popularity uh the president of france macron uh insists on doing this it seems to me that you know there's an escalation of the conflict and there's there are f too few forces i mean maybe the sort of uh you know john kenneth galbraith version of the world of restrained capitalism or whatever uh, i feel as if that's eroded and now the, there are these two major waves coming at each other which is why i feel emboldened to use a word like revolution do you get what i'm driving at 
yes, and I, I, I would I would underscore it. I think what we're seeing is a predictable behavior of a declining system, a declining empire. You, you know, when the United States was on the upswing, for example, after World War II, when all the competitors of the United States were, you know, basically destroyed, the Japanese on one end, the Germans on the other end, the Soviet Union, where all the war was fought and the destruction was unspeakable, the, the, the potential enemies were gone. The United States was king of the of the hill and took advantage of it, displaced all the old uh, empires with itself. The British Empire vanished, the French, uh, the Japanese, and the Americans became the hegemonic power, as we all know. And when, you're, when your economic growth rates are robust the way they were in the 50s and the 60s and into the 70s, when you had an expansive system, when you had a whole world of low-wage people producing the goods, the food and the raw materials and so forth you needed, yeah, you could be generous. You could give workers a few percentage increase in their standard of living every year. You were doing so well, you know, it, you could actually indulge the image of the rising tide that lifts all the boats. But when that's over, when the resistances and the alternatives to bowing down before the United States become attractive and numerous, and to make a long story short, that's where we are now. The BRICS is the future. Everyone knows it who isn't afraid of the taboo of saying it. China, India, Brazil. And what's happened is they are in a position, as the Chinese, for example, they've lifted 800 million of their people out of poverty over the last two years. That's not because they are communists or socialists. That's because they were economically able to grow at such a scale that they could do that even as they created a private capitalist sector, billionaires by the hundreds and so on. They were in that nice upswing portion that the United States had not so long ago, but we don't have it now. And as the system peaks and turns down, those at the top, here comes the punchline, those at the top who sit in the boards of directors, who have the wealth, who control the profits, they are in the best position to hold on to all the wealth and profits and the privileges they had longer than the average person. Those at the top are in a position to offload the costs of a declining system onto the mass of people. And that's what Macron is doing. He's offloading the costs of the decline of French capitalism onto elderly workers by cutting two years off their pension. It's disgusting, it's ugly, it's unjust, but that's all he's doing. And the Greeks, by privatizing, they are doing the same thing. If you do these kinds of things, well, let me give you an example even from private sector. Over the last eight months, most of the high-tech mammoths in our country have been laying off workers. If you add it up, it, it's several hundred thousand workers have been laid off. The money not spent on those people's salary and equipment has been used to buy back the stocks of those companies. You know what that means? Working people losing jobs and income, and the richest of the country who own the shares seeing the shares go up because of the buybacks. In other words, a small group of people, the boards of directors of a handful of companies, are worsening the inequality of wealth and income in America and imposing that reality on everybody else. The, the, the anti-democratic nature, that's why the symbolism in France is so important. Macron tried to get the parliament his parliament, in which his political party dominates, to pass the law to deprive people of two years of pension, and they wouldn't go along with him because they're not going to be reelected, those people, if they do. So he has to force it through with an undemocratic, thereby increasing by 10% overnight the opposition, which even if they don't mind the pension cut, 
are horrified by this breezy dismissal of the elite in France, of even the rules they used to follow. Yeah, these are the kinds of steps, not one or the other, but the accumulation of them that make the word revolution now on the agenda. But you, don't you take the responsibility, RJ. It's a situation that we're all watching that puts that on the agenda. Let me give you another example that uh, I think also gets neglected by our media. Uh, an amazing story, an important story that's getting very little coverage in this country is unfolding in 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 Pakistan. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the BRICS countries, uh, Russia, um, um, and uh, uh, India, and so on. Pakistan, fifth most populous country in the world, strategically important location, nuclear power. We had the former prime minister, Imran Khan, on this program two, three weeks ago. Since then, they've tried to arrest Imran Khan. There have been mass protests in his defense or riots outside his house. Somehow this, and, you know, I don't know the man's inner character. I would characterize him as a kind of... Um, somewhat left populist is what he seems to be uh and by the way i i don't consider populist a, uh, an inevitably a dirty word i mean you know i mean chantal mouffe among others the, the french uh philosopher you know points out that that uh, left populism is a good thing to be so but you have yet another country where there is this rising tension and and i think it's an open secret that pakistan's politics are heavily influenced by the cia u.s interests and so on you have these various you have greece you have you have pakistan you have france you have uh, you know this simmering unrest uh, elsewhere in the world and uh i just i just wonder at what point we have to say, you know, the uh, the anarchist uh, anthropologist David Graeber used to say, wrote about um, that re revolution as an ongoing process, right? You know, you might be in it and not even know it's happening. Right. And you might, there might be victories and you don't even identify them properly as victories because they seem small and we're waiting for that sort of white light moment. But it may be that it moves in to our eyes or to our subjective experience gradually, slowly, but then suddenly you look around and realize uh, something is shifting here. And um, all of which I guess is a way of saying um, what I don't know, actually, I'm stuck. But, but, but to me, I, I don't know if this is a tectonic shift or not, but I think it's important to take note and perhaps even to try to make sure it is a tectonic shift, if, if that isn't too radical a notion. No, and I think, look, our language is always partly the effect of what's going on and partly a shaper of what's going on. It, it's always both of those things, and we don't need to be apologetic about it. It couldn't be otherwise. We are what we are because of our surroundings and how we process and react to our surroundings changes our surroundings, which then again change us in a continuous, if you allow me the word, dialectic of, of or like dialogical um, uh, interaction. You know, I, I'm reminded of, of, of Lenin, who said about his revolutionary experience, for decades it looks like, he, these are his words more or less, for decades, it looks like nothing's happening. And then in a few weeks, decades happen. All right. I think it, it was wrong to say that nothing happened in those decades. And it's kind of wrong to say that decades happen. It's just that the pace is different. You know, the other example, which comes from Engels, is with water, right? You raise the temperature of water and it gets warmer, the water. And then at a certain point, you raise it another degree, and it becomes vapor. It completely changes. And if you go down, it goes from water to ice. to the sun. In other words, there are these quantitative changes that are small, but when you add them up, the cumulative effect is a sudden transformation in the quality of the thing. And I think we're seeing 
class struggles, if you like, becoming bigger, sharper, more determined, polarizing the population more. Uh, we're seeing it everywhere. And up comes out of the out of the woodwork uh, all the old arguments that people rediscover as they discover old feelings that they thought maybe history had put aside, but are just waiting for the situation to come back. And so, yeah, we talk about revolution. Suddenly we have socialists running for office in the United States and winning and, and staying in office. And we have white supremacy and we have, you know, all of these clashing but they're all signs of a deterioration of that sense of hegemonic continuity, which is the world in which the Trumps and and the Bidens and the and the Janet Yellens and and the Lindsey they all grew up in that. They don't understand that the world has changed, and they look lamely on. Uh, unable to control, unable to solve, bitter and frustrated, and increasingly pushed aside by the flow of events. And I, for one, celebrated. You know, when I was, uh, obviously, I've never been older, when I, so when I was younger, but uh, considerably younger, um, I did a lot of work. First, I did some work in Hungary uh, before the the fall of, you know, what's called the Iron Curtain when it was a communist country. Uh, although, you know, opening to the West uh, earlier than some of the other countries. And I, I, I worked in that region through the time of uh, the end of uh, European uh, state communism, first in those countries, and then, of course, in the Soviet Union. And... It was a fascinating experience in many ways uh, to see a system that had fortified itself for so many years and had become the de facto way of, and just the assumed way of life for everybody, for millions upon millions of people, change in the span of years. And one of the things I noticed about, many things I noticed about it, was that the process of liberalizing for lack of a better word uh that the soviet union and its you know related states went through actually encouraged the ultimate if you want to call it revolution transformation uh, although those gestures may have been intended to stave it off that momentum had begun and for better or for worse, you know, depending on, you know, we could, obviously there were many ways in which that was an improvement, but I also recall seeing homeless people on the streets of those cities for the first time, so as things changed. So, but um, my point being, I guess, that when a center of gravity begins to shift in a system, I think one of the things that the people you mentioned may not realize is there comes a point when that shift is irreversible and your inability to adapt to it becomes irrelevant. Uh, do you get what I'm driving at? Yeah. Yep. And I think that's where a great deal of the frustration in our in this in this country comes from. And not just among leaders, among masses of people, there is a sense that something has really shifted and that what was once is no longer retrievable. That's the appeal of a red hat that says, make America great again. I mean, it, it, it it's lost. I mean, you're wearing a red hat. It's not going to solve your problem. And, and that strange man that sits at the top and rants and raves, you kind of know somewhere that's not going to solve it either. And you saw that in four years, nothing in the fundamentally frustrating United States changed. He didn't deliver it. I mean, manufacturing he was going to bring back. Did that happen? No. Did the, the issues that agitate people in the South and Midwest that follow him, did those transform themselves? No. I mean, there's, there's very little in the real daily lives of Americans that is touched by what the Democratic or Republican parties do. And everybody knows it. Part of the reason we have so many people who don't participate in political anything 
is because they have concluded that it doesn't matter. And you can yell at them because there are little areas where it still does matter, but they have grasped the deeper truth that on the things that most needed by them, it doesn't matter. They need a secure job. They need decent income. They need a proper education system, transportation system, health care system. And neither of the political parties is giving them any of those things. And there's no prospect that they're going to do it. And they know it. And my biggest fear is that if, in fact, this kind of shift is taking place, uh, if, if somebody doesn't offer people a better alternative than a kind of ultra-nationalistic, bigoted, uh, you know, virulent form of mass agitation that you know, simply saying well, we're not as bad as Trump or DeSantis or whatever, that while that may objectively be true, that once this process begins, if something isn't offered that's clearly better and that clearly offers an alternative that people can grasp onto, that the alternative may be chaos or worse. Yeah, but the people who run the Democratic Party are the same old, same old. They are committed to what it is they do, which is basically keep the lid on the system. So they're not in a, you know, they can't offend their donors. They are locked in a battle with the Bernie Sanders and AOCs of the world. They don't want to go there. They're, they're afraid their party couldn't survive, and they're probably right. And so they're going to stay with what they are. And then the only question will be, which is stronger, the crazy stuff from the right wing or a part a Democratic Party that says we're not as crazy as they are. Vote for us. And that will leave the American people with an awful choice and all of the bitterness and frustration, which happens when you're awfully forced to an awful choice in which you feel de deprived either way. Which is why it's so important to have voices like yours, Richard Wolf, that um, say it doesn't have to be this way in East Palestine, Ohio. It doesn't have to be this way in the Rust Belt. It doesn't have to be this way at the uh, Amazon warehouse or anywhere else that people are suffering and struggling in this country. Because if we don't say that, then they're going to turn to the uh, more and more people, I'm afraid, whatever Trump's destiny is, will turn to demagogues or just despair and opioids and god knows what else so uh, i thank you for your great work in uh, in discussing these issues well it's my pleasure and i thank you for having a program that even imagines doing this kind of conversation i know it's needed if i had more time i would make the argument that in the 1930s the united states could very well have gone in the directions of germany or italy fascist or spain we didn't, and we didn't because a vibrant, militant labor movement, uh, the CIO, together with two socialist parties and a communist party, banded together and said a progressive alternative is possible, and then proved that they were right. And that it happened before in this country should give people, however depressed they might be now, the notion, yeah, we know it can happen here because it already did. Well, you did say it, and I'm glad you did, and I'm glad we're entering, ending on a positive note. As always, Richard Wolf, host of Economic Update, economist and economic historian, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you, RJ. I look forward to our next talk. As do I. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.